So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be here uh, this afternoon. Uh, you know, corrosion is probably not a topic uh, with which you are really familiar, but one thing I can tell you is there are many, many things which are interesting in, in, in corrosion. Uh, first thing first, I would say is that uh, I'm pretty convinced that corrosion will provide me a job until the end of my life. Uh, <laughs> You know, I've been in corrosion for a little bit less than 20 years, and what I'm seeing actually is that the challenges are being more and more complicated. Uh, we'll see later on why I'm telling this. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, among the things interested in, interesting in corrosion is that if I tell you corrosion, you have the sense of it. You. I think everyone has already seen a bit of corrosion on a car. Uh, every approximately 10 years, you have to replace your uh, hot water tank because of corrosion. Maybe on a daily basis, you travel on a bridge that shows some signs of corrosion. So we have, we have the sense of it. Uh, contrary to my students, I actually teach a course in physical chemistry. And for two weeks now, we talk about quantum mechanics. Uh, so their face becomes long like that uh, when we address this subject. So I try to make it the more simple as I can, but I think we all have the sense of corrosion. The other thing is that, uh, fortunately, for me at least, uh, corrosion has always been a pretty conservative engineering domain. What I mean by that is that if you have a big companies that address corrosion challenges for, let's say, 100 year, years, they have some legacy on which they built. So for many years, let's say, for example, they are used to work with a specific standard. They always qualify their materials with this standard and things are going well. But happen a moment where uh, the industry changed the materials list really drastically, as we've seen, let's say, five years ago in the auto industry. Then what is happening is that many of those standards, standards, you can put them in the garbage. And you have to restart from scratch. This legacy no longer has a real technical or engineering value. So because of that, uh, what I'm seeing for, let's say, 10 years is that the wind is really turning and companies, car OEMs and all their suppliers, they are asking for much more reliable ways to address corrosion challenges. So the way we address corrosion at NRC, uh, first thing, if you look on the right, real life. So that's the best way to approach corrosion. Uh, you care about, let's say, one type of specific sample, how it's going to behave on the road. Sample, you put it on the road for a few years and you see afterwards. So you will have the real picture. But the problem here is that you need time. And most companies, they don't have that time. Then you go more on the left, the experimental side. Here you have tests such as Salzburg the famous ESTM B117, or uh, each organ standard organization has a standard which is the equivalent of this B117. Then you put your sample in a cyclic, in a, in a corrosion chamber, you have a salt spray, 35 degrees C, 5% sodium chloride for a, set, a thousand hours. Then you remove your samples and you look at them and you try to dress some conclusion. But can you rely on this test to understand what is happening on the road? Uh, when I started my career at NRC 12 years ago, almost on a weekly basis, I received phone call from companies. They ask, OK, this specific uh, standard, does it at least represent five years in service? <laughs> I don't know. No, nobody knows. 99.9% .9 of standards they do not rely on real life situations. That's the reality. Then people started to say, okay, if salt spray doesn't work, we'll work with a cyclic corrosion test that better, that better mimics the real life. So you have a wet step, a drying step, and something like that. 
If you look at those standards, let's say you take 100 of those <coughs> cyclic standards, you will probably find that 95 of them, they mention a, a, a step at a temperature of 60 degrees C. So the question here is, if you, uh, if you are, uh, if you consider a car under a situation that provoke corrosion, do you really think you will see a temperature of 60 degrees C? Uh, I'm from Quebec. <laughs> when we see corrosion, usually we are at zero degrees C or below. So zero degrees C for galvanic corrosion is the worst temperature. Above that, it decreases. Below that, it decreases. At 60 degrees C, let's say you have some traces of salt water, it's going to dry in, in seconds. So it doesn't make sense to work at 60 degrees C. So what I can tell is that most of those standards, standards they cannot rely on real life. So you don't want to go in real life, it takes two time, okay, you go on in the lab, let's say for uh, cyclic corrosion tests, the problem is that the industry, they don't really rely on them. You go on the left, digital simulation, great, it's pretty fast, it takes maybe seconds. So the model we built, we try to have them computing within 30 seconds, generally. generally. So it's fast, but is it the truth? To know that, you have to go back on the right and check in real life. You know, it, it, it's kind of an infinite loop. How can you get out of, of this loop? So what we started to do is to look at machine learning data science to have a good correlation or to make much more comprehensive those three different and complementary steps. So if we go in real life, we take time, okay, we stop everything, for, let's say for two years, we have many companies with us and we say, okay, let, let's, do, let's do a lot of steps back. Let's put our samples on the road. We'll figure out how they behave. At the same time, we will monitor the temperature, wetness, humidity, the GPS position of the vehicle, its speed. Uh, do we have some snow on the, on the ground or not? We'll monitor all this. Afterwards, we'll go in the lab and try to reproduce this real environment. So instead of working at 100 or 60 degrees C, we'll reproduce the real environment. Then when we'll have something strong, we'll put this into a digital model and we will make sure that it is calibrated to reproduce the real life. So that's my first slide, but probably the longest one. <laughs> okay, I'll be shorter on, on the other one. So essentially that's the approach, uh, we move forward uh, for a few years now. So here we have, uh, you see samples on the road. Uh, on the right, you have a 53 foot trailer. For this specific project, we have had those panels or two feet by two feet. We had three of them fully instrumented to measure all the, the stuff I mentioned uh, previously. For some clients, we also put uh, 10 foot long racks with hundreds of samples. So depending on clients' needs, uh, we, we can customize everything. Uh, and using this road approach, we can figure out what is the real galvanic corrosion behavior. Stress corrosion and cracking. Stress corrosion and cracking, at the time that steel was the only one material uh, to build car, it was not a big issue. But now, now we are talking about lightweighting, so we bring materials such as high strength aluminum alloys, the 7000 series among others. Uh, we combine to this carbon fiber reinforced polymers. The carbon fiber is a good cathode material that will induce corrosion to steel, to aluminum. So we are now combining all those materials and that was not the case 10 years ago. Now that's the, the reality. So stress corrosion cracking is uh, a real nightmare for people that want to use high strength aluminum alloys. Filiform corrosion, again, that's, that could be a big issue if you have copper rich alloys. Crevice corrosion, the crevice is a very tight opening. If you combine different materials, 
then you may increase the number of joining uh, you, of joints you will have on your vehicle. Then you you increase your chance to have crevice corrosion and general and pitting corrosion for for sure. So today I'm going to really concentrate on the first one. So ultimately we'll address everything, all this in uh, in numerical simulation. For example, pitting corrosion can be addressed using. Uh, for example, SCCM, scanning electrochemical microscope uh, techniques. But today I'm going to really uh, stay on the galvanic corrosion issue. So how can we, using the numerical simula simulation approach, really cut the time to market? Uh, let's consider the simulation you have on the left. So we put two materials in contact. We have aluminum with carbon fiber. What is going to happen here if you don't have this bar, in, uh, which is yellow red? If you simply have aluminum with CFRP, CFRP will make the aluminum corroding. Now, we've, what we've put is a sacrificial insert. We put it directly on the CFRP. It has no structural function. Its only function is to have the, is to, let's say, eat the anodic current instead of having the anodic current flowing on the structural aluminum material next to the CFRP. So here we protect the structural component with this insert, sacrificial insert. Simulation speaking, it works. We go into the lab in black, you have the galvanic current that will flow in, in you, between your two structural materials, you see it is pretty high. If you had the insert, you have the curve in blue, you see that you drastically cut the galvanic current. So in lab, it works. Does it work in the field? We put the assemblies you do see on the left, we, we build them, we put them on vehicles. At seven different locations, uh, behind a mud flap, over a wheel, in front of the wheel, they spend the whole winter uh, on, the, on, the, on the vehicle. So here we have simply a very short time span. On the left, you have the bars for the assemblies without any protection. On the right, we have the galvanic current flowing if we have this sacrificial insert. So you see in the field, it works. But the problem here is that we probably lost a month in the lab to figure out if it's going to work or not. So that's an example of turnaround that we would like to do with simulation. So if we can skip as much as as much as possible the lab steps, then we will gain a lot of time. So one thing we, we've started to develop are uh, corrosion applications using uh, the app building uh, functionality within Comsol. So what you do see here, this is an application we've built and we put it uh, on the Comsol server. Actually, uh, we are struggling to put the, uh, these application on the web simply because NRC is part of the federal government. So we do have something like 7,000 rules to follow uh, to be in good, in good line with the law. So actually, we are considering other approaches, let's say, have those uh, applications uh, hosted by the pri private companies. Uh, but nonetheless, we will be there a day. Uh, what you see here, we have a combination of different materials. If I remember something like 15 different materials. So from the galvanic corrosion standpoint, that's, that's a real nightmare. We have a lot of different materials combined together. So here we can, the user can select the materials he wants to use. Uh, so he can uh, put a material where you want it. Afterwards, you select the electrolyte thickness. You can select the convection <coughs> level. So that's the version, let's say version 0 0.0.1. Uh, at that time, the user was asking to select the electrolyte thickness. But most of them, they, they don't really care about that. They don't know what is the electrolyte thickness. Now, what we are putting in our apps that we, dis that we generate using the console compiler and then we distribute to our clients through uh, exe files that they can execute. We ask questions like, where your sample will be located on the vehicle? Is it under the vehicle at the front, at the back, uh, 
at the back of a mud flap, for example. So we ask questions like that. So there the client can say, OK, it's going to be, uh, let's say, above a wheel. Then you select this functionality. This, this is something great because we can customize it really uh, in accordance with the client needs. So in that case, when you click here, it generates the text file you do see in the center of the, sc of the screen. Afterwards, you can run the MATLAB script, script you see on the right. So this one is going to read directly the text file, and it's going to generate this figure. What you see on this figure, for example, you see this insert here? We put it there just as we've done with the first simulation I've shown you. We put it there to protect the component that we call bottom four. This is an aluminum substrate. This one here, main four, is a CFRP, according to what we've selected in the model. So what we would like to have is a very low anodic current on bottom four and a very high anodic current on the insert. And this is what we do have here. If you look at the insert, the total current that flows is roughly 1.25 milliamps. And bottom four, it is pretty low, a few, a few microamps. So it does its job, by protect, and it protects the, uh, the substrate it has to protect. Now, does it work? Initially, this uh, sacrificial material was 0.5 millimeter in thickness. You see down here the thickness loss as a function of time during the lab exposure. So we are in good agreement with, uh, we have a good agreement between the model and the lab tests. Another thing we can do, let's say you have this material here. So in the center, this is a CFRP. You have three stainless steel rivets, an aluminum rivet, and two aluminum components, 6022 at the bottom, 6061 on the top. And those samples are painted. The aluminum is painted, excepted for uh, a teeny area in the center. We, we have scribed the surface. So what you see here, this rivet is, uh, we see an anodic current on this one. So this one is going to be dissolved. And it's never a good idea to use a rivet as a sacrificial component, uh, from what I've learned, at least. <laughs> uh, now, the consequence of that is that if you look at the scribe here on the aluminum, you have a very low current densi density here very high current density here. So regardless of the alloy, you would have the same current density because you have the same cathode material. The cathode drives the intensity of the current. So using the model, what you see here is that maybe something is going to happen on the 6022 component. I don't know. So we, go, we went to the lab, and then we scribe the materials, the two corresponding materials, we put them, we put an electrochemical cell on them, and then we have applied this current density, this, the current density that the model provided us with. And then overnight, 17.4 hours simply because we did it overnight. Overnight, we took, the, the, the day after, we took a knife, and then we tried to peel the paint. What we found is that for the 6022, material, so the one that was located here, we were able to peel the paint. So what we can figure out is that this damage here, according to the model, should generate some paint disbonding. But here, we've applied the current. Previously, what you've seen in that case, Everything is developed naturally. This is galvanic corrosion. The, corro the, the current is generated by itself. So if we take this complex assembly that you see here, if we put it under a lab test with cyclic immersion and drying and not too warm in temperature, I never go to 60 degrees C. But what is happening? This is what we've tried here. The 60-61 material, very low current density, no disbonding after the polarization at the appropriate current density. After the lab exposure, we tried to peel the paint. It stayed there. 
With the high current density in the lab, under polarization, it disbonded. Now, if we try to peel it after the lab exposure, under a cycle, uh, under cycle of uh, wetting, drying, we see that we can easily peel it. So the end of the story is that instead of going with a very long lab exposure like we've done here, we can simply run the model. It takes a few minutes. OK, we seem to have a problem here. Then we address it overnight. And this is the, con the consequence we will have. We don't have to expose this very complex assembly. Uh, the last subject I'd like to cover, I, I mentioned this one, OK? Uh, actually, the way we work with clients, we generate EXE files uh, with the ComSol compiler. This is the version one of the Altec Corrosion app. Altec is a consortium that we have at NRC. Uh, we have, I think, 25 companies in there. So actually, they have in hand the, the version one. They can run it on their computers. The last topic I'd like to cover is the combination of machine learning and FEA uh, simulation. <coughs> you know, a few years ago, uh, there was a, a, a buzzword that was green. Everything had to be green. Uh, today, everything has to be connected. Everything has to address machine learning. Uh, so th th that's great. But we have to remember that machine learning is one thing, and before that, numerical simulation was there. And it has to continue to be there. So I think the good approach is to say, OK, I'm going to use those two complementary tools. And I'm going to try to extract a new information by, combine, by combining those two. So this is what we've done here. Let's say you have a vehicle. You care about what's going to be the intensity of galvanic corrosion you will see on this vehicle if you combine two specific materials. Then what you do, you measure the wetness you have on the vehicle. So this simply tells you if your surfaces are wet or dried. And you also measure temperature and humidity. So for a certain period of time during, let's say, winter, you monitor those, those data. Then the output that you do have is the temperature, humidity, and wetness as a function of time, small t. Then what you do? What, what we've done, we take those values and we put them into a machine learning model. This machine learning model here, it learned something from vehicles 2, 3, and 4. So from vehicles that are different from the first one you have on top left. So what do we have? We have a, an output. We take the output, we put it directly into Comsol Multiphysic along with polarization curves to simulate the, the material's behavior. And what we obtain is the variation of galvanic current as a function of time for a specific galvanic couple. So this is, theoretically speaking, the current that we should measure for this vehicle. In reality, we measured the current for vehicle one. That's the curve in red. So the, the rusty car here, we have those data. It was not this vehicle, but you know what I mean. Uh, so you see here, on-road data versus the output of combining machine learning with FEA, we have a very good agreement between those two sets of data. And on the right, you see here, as a function of time, the, uh, the current, the anodic current, how it flows on the substrate. This is essentially what I had for uh, today. Thank you. <laughs>